Following an unauthorized trip to Saudi Arabia, Leo Messi is reportedly about to sign a deal with Al Hilal in Saudi Arabia for $600 million a year. But how have we got to this point and what are the financial consequences and considerations for Leo's next move? My name is Neil Wood and I'm a football finance professional. If you want to learn more about finance through the medium of football, or if you want to learn more about why the most famous footballer and arguably the greatest footballer of all time has moved from his childhood club, Barcelona, to PSG, and now looking for a massive money move to Saudi Arabia, then stay tuned. If you like the video, please hit like, subscribe if you want to learn more about football finance, leave your thoughts in the comments below, and share this video with your friends. Messi joined PSG in August 2021 on the back of some financial fair play restrictions in La Liga for Barcelona. He walked away from the club on a free transfer. At the time, Messi had a reported market value of 80 million euros, at least according to Transfermarkt. So this was a steal from PSG's perspective. But from an accounting point of view, if a player reaches the end of their contract, they can walk away for free. Messi signed a two-year deal to the end of June 2023, and that date is now on the horizon, meaning Messi is about to consider his options. And this week, news has broke of a big money deal to Saudi Arabia, having previously been looking likely to move back to Barcelona, his boyhood club. When joining PSG, Messi had a signing on bonus of a reported 25 million euros and was earning 35 to 40 million euros, including add-ons up until the end of June 2023. There was an option to extend his contract, but having fallen out with the club with an unauthorized trip to Saudi Arabia, where he is ambassador for football, it now looks unlikely that Messi will stay at PSG. Whilst playing in France, Messi has been paying tax to the French government of up to 45% in income taxes, plus social security add-ons, meaning he'll lose approximately 50% of his wage, just like any footballer would do playing in England. From PSG's perspective, it doesn't appear that cash is an issue, with substantial losses being underwritten by their Qatari ownership, meaning they have the ability to sign stars such as Messi, Neymar and Mbappe, plus many more. From a French FFP perspective, the National Directorate of Management Control, or French DNCG, which is the body that controls football governance in France, is looking to tighten their rules, which are relatively relaxed in comparison to La Liga, or even UEFA's FFP rules. It's rumored that from 23-24, the French DNCG will restrict wages at 70% of revenues from a club's perspective, meaning PSG potentially have a problem on the horizon and it may be beneficial to let Messi walk away. Previously, the French rules looked to govern sustainability of the game, encouraging underwriting losses, but not necessarily focusing on clubs maintaining a profitable status or even a break-even status. Clubs have been able to lose as much money as they wish, as long as owners have been able to underwrite those losses with equity contributions. This means that clubs remain solvent and allows for investments from owners who are able to and can afford to spend. And this partially explains why PSG were able to make a 369 million euro loss in 21-22. PSG, however, do have to comply with UEFA's FFP rules and have previously been sanctioned by UEFA for breaching FFP. A fine of 10 million euros with a deferred fine of 55 million euros subject to compliance over a three year period is now on the table for PSG. Given that in that period, FFP or financial fair play from UEFA's perspective will transition to financial sustainability regulations and all clubs will not need to be assessed it's unlikely that that will be the case for PSG under this sanction. And UEFA would have agreed financial metrics that the club would have to hit over that period. So from PSG's perspective, now might be a good time for Messi to walk away, saving a substantial wage bill that would have increased if he were to have stayed. Given the fallout of the Saudi Arabia trip that was unauthorized by PSG, rumors have been circulating about Leo's next move. Could it be a return to his boyhood club, Barcelona? A move that I'm sure will be close to Messi's heart. Could a move to the US be on the cards, with Inter Miami in particular looking to sign Messi? Or given the links to Saudi Arabia, where Messi is an ambassador for football, could that be his next move? By the time this video has gone live, it may well have been confirmed. But why did Messi move from Barcelona to begin with and end up at PSG? If that move hadn't have happened, could he still now be playing at Barcelona? Well, that was down to one thing, 
finances. And this channel is dedicated to teaching you about finances through Demeter Myth Football. So if you like the video, hit like and subscribe for more video content on the topic of football finance. Back in 2021, Barcelona was struggling financially, both from a cash perspective and an accounting point of view. Losses were substantial, fans hadn't attended games, and COVID-19 had ripped through the club, leaving a hole that needed to be filled. Since La Liga refused to relax its rules on the back of the pandemic, like the Premier League had done, and like UEFA had done, it left all clubs fighting with the restrictions that come with La Liga's rules. Barcelona's costs remained high, with an attempt to defer wages and renegotiate player contracts being the highest cost of any club. But with fans unable to attend games, their finances took a substantial hit. Meaning that even with the return of fans and wage deferrals into the following seasons, they were unable to comply with a budgeted break-even model that is set at the beginning of each financial year in La Liga. La Liga's rules have the best intentions at its centre. The protection of the long-term viability of the game, the clubs and the league. But what does that do to the clubs that are involved in a competitive league environment? Well, first of all, we need to understand the landscape as the rules were set. And quite simply, from a broadcasting revenue distribution perspective, we had a duopoly. Barcelona and Real Madrid dominated financially in La Liga, meaning that they were able to attract the best talent in Spain and across Europe, if not the world. The Spanish broadcasting deal was heavily weighted to the top two placed clubs in the division. And as soon as La Liga's rules were introduced, they solidified that position at a point in time, as any other set of rules would do, almost making it impossible for anybody else to compete with those top two clubs. But on the back of poor decisions and financial mismanagement, particularly at Barcelona, the club has now struggled and is unable to comply with the break-even model that La Liga demands of its clubs. La Liga's rules measures costs and debt against clubs' income, with the knowledge of the previous year's income. The league knows what the commercial deals were, what income was generated on a match day, what income would be generated from a broadcasting deal, and any increases beyond what you had previously need to be justified to the league. The income is measured against the costs of players and the cost of debt, and a true break-even model must be adopted in order for clubs to be able to register to compete within the league. The system does not allow you to continue trying to register players to compete in the following season. The problem with Messi was that he was out of contract and he needed to be able to re-sign in 2021, something that the club was unable to do according to La Liga's system. But is this beneficial to the club, to the player, or even the league? As we said earlier, these rules are with the best intentions, with the long-term view of sustaining football in Spain, attracting investment in what would be a financially viable club, league, and ecosystem. But is that truly the case? Investors look for a financial return, and investors tend to want to invest. In footballing terms, that means spending money in order to increase the value of the club, and it tends to come with making losses. Looking at Manchester United, it was bought for around about seven, eight hundred million pounds, and is now potentially being sold for five or even six billion pounds, depending on whether the valuation from the Glazers is being met. Over that time frame of ownership from the Glazers, profits have turned into losses. There's now rumours of Manchester United breaching UEFA's FFP and other clubs are in similar positions, yet their values in England have increased dramatically. Look at Chelsea, bought for four and a half billion pounds. So investors don't need to necessarily make a profit in order to want to invest. Some are more than happy to invest in the club in order to increase the value in five, 10, 15, or even 20 years time. That model is not promoted by La Liga. And that then restricts the investment in the playing squad meaning that the talent isn't necessarily going to be as competitive because talent can be attracted again by money, as we're seeing with Messi, who is now on the verge of signing a $600 million deal with Al-Hilal in Saudi Arabia. The best talent in the world, Messi and Ronaldo, will play in Saudi Arabia looking for that paycheck. 
So if it's purely about finances, La Liga is going to push away the more talented football players and attract only ones that want to play at those historically successful clubs such as Barcelona or Real Madrid because it's what they believe in here or what they've always wanted to do. The Premier League, on the other hand, is able to attract investment with an even distribution or at least a more even distribution of broadcasting revenues, which creates a competitive product on a more level playing field from a financial perspective. Even though there is some disparity, the broadcasting deal allows for some clubs to be able to invest substantial amounts of money and compete. It also allows English football to be an importer of talent with cash flowing out of the clubs into the pockets of other clubs around the world, primarily in Europe. But what does that do? It creates a more long-term investment model where football is more attractive and competitive. Or at least that's what's happened since the formation of the Premier League. We have slowly seen a shift in power from Spanish football and Italian football across to English football. And we're now seeing arguments being formed that the Premier League is too powerful and should redistribute its wealth across Europe to the benefit of the football ecosystem across Europe as a whole. Arguments which some have vehemently been against. To be fair to Barcelona, they've tried their best to comply with the rules and also come up with some innovative ways where they could potentially increase their squad cost limit. Their squad cost limit being amortization of player registrations, salaries, benefits in kind, image rights, and agent fees. That limit is set and dictated by the budget based on that previously described break-even model. The squad cost that any club has to play with can be increased by five items. Number one, the proceeds of player registration sales. Number two, extraordinary profits. Number three, audiovisual contract increases. Number four, capital contributions. And number five, other revenue increases. If we consider the fourth item first, capital contributions are actually restricted depending on the category that the club sits in. If the intention is that capital contributions are to be used for the increase of the squad cost, then they can't be used in their entirety when they're injected. They're spread over future periods, meaning that Barcelona or even any other club wouldn't be able to spend 100% of that contribution. If clubs were to be able to sell players, then the profits on the sale of the player registrations would contribute to that squad cost limit. But Barcelona didn't want to sell any players, which left them with three options. Extraordinary profits, other revenue increases, or audio-visual contract increases. And that will go some way to explain why you'll have seen certain transactions or economic levers being pulled by Barcelona. What Barcelona did was sell assets which weren't recognised on their balance sheet, such as the future La Liga broadcasting rights, which from an accounting perspective would have been accounted for as debt. There was no revenue to be recognised from a purely accounting perspective. If we take the sale of La Liga's broadcasting rights to 6th Street, for example, this, from an accounting point of view, is a financing transaction, a cash exchange for future distributions. There's obviously a link to Barcelona's on-pitch performance and broadcasting revenue, but since Barcelona are in this duopoly where they effectively get the majority of the broadcasting rights from La Liga, they're almost guaranteed a certain amount over the next period, assuming that they're able to compete on the pitch and don't fall into the third or even fourth place position in La Liga, something that Sixth Street has taken a gamble on. So there is a variable element to the amount of repayments. But from Barcelona's perspective, they will have come up with a way that this would have been classified as extraordinary profits. That would be subject to review under La Liga's rules to understand whether it could be used to increase the squad cost limit. These economic levers were being pulled by the club well after Leo Messi had left the club, which suggests that even with his departure, the club was still struggling. They would obviously benefit from that cash injection, but the sale of 25 years worth of broadcasting rights, or at least a percentage of those, effectively constitutes debt, which is something that the league rules are designed to discourage. Instead, they're having the opposite effect. And Barcelona are gambling or have gambled with the future of the club, or at least a proportion of it, in order for it to be able to try to spend on a greater squad cost limit. 
What are your thoughts on that? Leave your comments below. All in all, the rules in combination with the high wage bill and Barcelona's ambition to attract and continue to attract the best talent in Europe means that something has to give. Either players are going to have to take pay cuts in order to be able to comply with the rules and play at the club that they wish to play at, or talent will be attracted elsewhere by the finances that are on the table from other clubs. And that's exactly what's happened although indirectly via PSG for Lionel Messi. But what about this move from Lionel Messi to Saudi Arabia? $600 million per year. In comparison to the PSG 35 or 40 million euro contract, at least from a salary perspective, it's a 27 or 28 fold increase on a net basis because taxes aren't payable in Saudi Arabia on your income. This is an eye-watering amount of money for anyone to turn down. So at the time of recording this video, it's been reported that Messi is about to sign that deal. And by the time this video has been released, we might know more. So leave an updated comment below. But what about the MLS? Well, it appears now that that's off the table. Given the reports from Saudi Arabia that Messi is about to head there, I do not believe that the MLS were going to be able to compete with that sort of money. If this was purely about finances, you'd probably have to double the amount that's being offered by Saudi Arabia to Messi in order for him to be able to compete financially in the MLS. And that is quite simply unrealistic. In the MLS, however, there is a mechanism which is called the designated player that allows clubs to assign this status to certain players. And that means that they will not be in the salary cap from the MLS. A club is able to sign players independently and pay them. Whereas normally players competing in the MLS under the salary cap rule would be signed by the league and paid centrally. So if Messi has signed that deal or if he is about to sign the deal, it's very clearly about finances. The Middle Eastern football market is taking things very seriously and has the power both financially and with no restrictions from a financial fair play perspective, both domestically or on a continental stage, to be able to compete to attract the best talent in the world. Is this good for football? Is a move by Ronaldo and now Messi the best way for them to finish their careers? Is football now all about the money? Leave your comments below. Are clubs like Barcelona and Real Madrid ever going to be able to compete financially, both from a cash perspective attracting investment and from an FFP perspective, trying to compete in a domestic landscape which doesn't allow them to be competitive both on a European stage or even domestically with other countries and leagues such as the English Premier League. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. If you like the video, hit like. Subscribe for more football finance related videos. My name's Neil Wood and I'm a football finance professional. Thanks for watching.